Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the International Conference on Advances in Forensic Science, IPEPS 2023. Today, we have two plenary sessions and two oral presentations, along with the poster presentation session lined up. ICAFS DFP1. A very good morning to all present over here. My code is ICAFS DFP1. The topic I would like to present here is cyber psychology. It seems we are very new to this topic, but it got its start back in the 1990s. It is a relatively young branch of psychology. It is a it began to gain relevance during the 2000s with the rise of social media. So let's first understand what is cyber psychology. It is the study of pertaining the way people interact through computers or digital devices and the emotional effects that usage has on the brain. Cyber psychology is especially interested in the effects of social media and virtual reality on the minds of users. It studies the mental and emotional effects, implications and phenomena of computer and internet use. The study shows how people think and behave in different ways by using technology. So now let's see what is the purpose of cyber psychology. It exists to pursue and formalize a scientific understanding of the impact, dynamic processes and outcomes that democratized digital technologies have enabled in individuals, groups, and the wider society. Nowadays, people are more addicted to social media such that no family members have time to sit and talk at one place. Everyone is busy with their own social media. Their day starts with social media and ends up with the same. This can be explained by taking a case study of Lambda Mo. It was a video game in 1990s. The research was done online survey, personal interviews, and some additional procedures. The result found was the strong prevalence of personal one-on-one -on -one social interactions over larger social gatherings. There are some more recent case studies such as Blue Whale Game, PUBG, uh, which affected the minds of children and adolescents. So who are the most affected ones by the social media? The teenagers, yes. Teenage years are considered the most challenging and critical phase for young people. This is because many teenagers face an identity crisis during this stage and intend to explore the internet and become addicted to it very quickly. In this world, each and every tiny thing has both advantage as well as disadvantage. It's up to us how we use them. Technological developments have provided us with many opportunities. Sadly, that's not the whole story. Technology also provides cyber criminals with endless new methods for exploitation. So one noted effect of social media is the lowering of a person's self-esteem due to the constant comparison of their own life to the glamorized lives portrayed by the people they follow online. And some effects are it's addictive, it triggers more sadness, less well-being, comparing our lives with others is mentally unhealthy, it can lead to jealousy. We get caught in the delusion of thinking it will help us. So the concluding part is that Developing prevention interventions should primarily target children and adolescents at risk of internet addiction, as children and adolescents are not much aware about how the social media and updated technologies may affect their mind and behavior. Overuse of the internet can lead to individual psychology, including mental and emotional. Therefore, understanding the cyber psychological factors related to internet addiction is crucial to predicting and diagnosing an individual's condition. That's all about my, my topic. Thank you. I would like to thank the Christogenity College Bengaluru for giving me an opportunity to present my poster and showcase my talent. Special thanks to the dignitaries. Thank you one and all. Good afternoon, respected dignitaries, conveners, and everyone present here. Today I'll be presenting on network forensics tools and techniques and my participation code is ICAFS DFP2. Now coming to the introduction, what is network forensics? Network forensics falls under digital forensics and it is related to the investigation of evidence left behind on a network following a cyber attack. The evidences provide clues to what weaknesses led to the security breach and who may be behind it. Network forensics is mainly used in cases of unauthorized access and data theft, leakage, etc. 
methodology. Uh, it works on the OSCAR formulation. O stands for obtaining information, which is collection of general information about the incident, like date and time of occurrence, how many people were involved, etc. S stands for strategy, that is planning of how the investigation is going to take place. C stands for collecting evidence, then how the proper collection of evidence is going to be done, documentation and transparency quotation of the evidence. A stands for analyzing the collecting evidence. And uh, lastly, R stands for the report, which is reporting the results of the investigation that was done. Now coming to the security tools, I have chosen Wireshark and T-Shark. They are network protocol analyzers. Uh, T-Shark is basically a terminal oriented version of Wireshark. They capture packet data from a light network and they can even save the data. Uh, the format that is used by Wireshark and DShark to store packet data are um, C PCA PNG format. And why is it used? They are used for troubleshooting networks that have performance issues and cybersecurity professionals use this for the detection of any intrusion or malware that may be installed in the network. The conclusion that we can take from the poster is that law enforcement users net, uh, network forensic to analyze network traffic that is again suspected of some criminal activity hence it is essential to use different tools and techniques for improving the investigation process and for increasing its accuracy the references that i have used for the for making the poster are done so thank you that was all for my presentation good afternoon everyone my code is ICAFS DFP3. I hereby present a poster on the topic Android Data Extractor Lit. Mobile phones are widely used by people. It is very rare to find a person with a mobile phone. Therefore, it is increasingly important source of digital evidence. Mobile forensic is a subset of digital forensic which deals with the recovery of evidence from mobile phones. Data Extractor Lite is a forensic tool that has the ability to automatically dump selected SQLite database files from the Android device and extract the contents stored within the dump files. Coming to its methodology, it was initially developed for 2x version of the Android. And it can also be used in the subsequent uh, Android versions with updations. In, uh, in explanation of the figure given, ADL uh, extracts data from the uh, Android device and they uh, are stored into the dump file and then they get analyzed and they create a report and they are saved into the investigator's file. Coming to the basic developmental guidelines. Be, uh, be, uh, basic developmental guidelines says about three, th uh, three components, that is the forensic principle, extensibility, and usability. Forensic principality, uh, they uh, uh, mostly talks about the how the uh, data has to be handled and uh, the uh, data has to be uh, uh, analyzed in, in a copy of the database, not, but not on the, uh, directly on the device. The extensibility tells that the program is, is being developed in a modular form and it contains two modules as the analysis and the report part. Usability talks about the uh, how the uh, system should be simple enough for a person who's a non-expert sh uh, is uh, should be able to use and as well as understand the report being produced. Data extraction. Data extraction, uh, in order to extract the data, the uh, application uses a software called Android Software Development Kit. Here, it contains a uh, uh, Android debug, uh, debug, uh, Android uh, debug bridge, which uh, contain, uh, which helps in connecting the Android device, and uh, we can, uh, we are able to ex execute commands on it. The next one, the uh, next part is the parsing of SQLI database files, and these database files can be uh, the call logs or SMS uh, messages or even the calendar entries in the uh, phone. So in order to extract these data, they need to extract the SQLite database file. Uh, they have to go into the low level uh, data structure and they opens this uh, database in a read only mode and reads the header where they get the uh, basic information about it. On analyzing the header, they, uh, they analyze the SQL master where they are able to understand the contents in it. After the entire completion of the uh, B3 structure, they are able to get the entire details which are uh, under the uh, under the table uh, 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 under the table. And coming to the reporting part, the uh, 
it basically talks about how in which form the uh, data is uh, is being obtained here the data has been ob obtained in an xml file format and the report module uh, will be uh, automatically creating the xml file and uh, also uh, in a forensic point of view what we can tell is that uh, the uh, we give most importance to the uh, call history, like uh, SIM card information, SMS, calendar entries, and telephone book call list, all these things that we are, we are giving more importance to uh, those databases. Uh, coming to the conclusion part, um, uh, I would like to say ADL is a very good instrument and which is cost effective uh, and helps in uh, data ex uh, extraction from a device. And uh, they have also uh, taken into consideration. Uh, taken good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to present a poster on reliability of brain fingerprinting in detecting concealed information. So starting off with the introduction, in 1980, an American neuroscientist, Barry Pavel, devised a brain wave fingerprinting technique. He found that a memory encoding related multifaceted electroencephalographic response, that is MER, MER, is initiated in the accused when the brain recognizes information pertaining to the crime. Brain fingerprinting is also known as brain mapping, and it refers to the EEG or ERP signals, that is electroencephalogram or event-related potential signals to detect deception. Commonly used method in India is called as brain uh, electrical activation profile test, also known as P300 waves test. Working on uh, working of brain fingerprinting, the subject who is wearing a specific headband designed to detect brainwave responses is shown in a succession of uh, words, phrases, or pictures on a monitor, as you can see in the image. When the brain perceives something, the activity of the neurons changes, causing variations in brain activity, brain patterns. So the system is controlled by a computer, including a presentation of stimuli. The recording of the electrical brain activity and mathematical data algorithm analyzes stimuli responses and determines whether information is present or information is absent. So three kinds of stimuli is obtained. That is irrelevant stimuli, that is irrelevant to the investigated situation and the subjects. Test stimuli, that is relevant to the test uh, investigated situation and also known to the subject. Probe stimuli, that are relevant to the investigated situation and are denied by the subject. The stimulus as well as the sin are determined by different colors of lines, as you can see in the graph. The red line, which indicates that the suspect is likely to be aware of the crime and it is result of the target stimulus. Green line indicates the suspect is unaware of the information and appears as a result of an unrelated stimulation. Blue line appears when the suspect is just aware of the information and suspect's brain are to blame. So when the red line and blue line are in very much clo uh, close correlation, it means the information is present. And when they are not in uh, correlation, the information present in the brain is absent. Applications of brain fingerprinting are, it is an objective method of detecting features of uh, crime recorded in the suspect's brain. It helps, to, uh, it helps in criminal justice and also in medical field, also to counter national threats. Whereas the limitations of this test uh, is that it cannot be used if the suspect learns everything the investigations know about the crime for some valid reasons. If a suspect admits uh, to being at the crime scene but claims to be a witness rather than a perpetrator, the fact that he knows the information about the crime is irrelevant. Other limitations of this include uh, it's costlier than other deception techniques like polygraph, EEG, or other narco analysis. Here I've taken two uh, case studies where a brain uh, mapping was used as it in Indian context, it's rarely used. So the in one scenario, in one case, the accused uh, Surinder Kohli's brain mapping and narco test in the Nithihari killings led the forensic experts to conclude in court that the accused was suffering from a sexual pervasion illness known as necrophilia. The Supreme Court in the second scenario, the Supreme Court upheld in the Selvi versus the state of Karnataka case in 2010 that uh, narco analysis, polygraph, and brain fingerprinting tests cannot be forced on anyone without their agreement, that is, without their consent. Hence, the reliability of brain fingerprinting comes to a question. So in India, the results of, from the brain fingerprinting conducted with the voluntary consent of the subject is not always admitted as the evidence in the court. The main reason being that the test infringed the accused uh, or witnesses' basic rights. Therefore, uh, it accuses the right to, against self-incrimination provided under Article 20, Subclause 3 of the Indian Constitution, according to which uh, no person accused of an offence shall be compelled to a witness against him or herself. 
and the second uh, uh, right is the right to life and personal liberty provided under article 21 hence it becomes imperative to analyze the these two clauses uh, these two articles in the indian constitution thank you so these days people are totally dependent on the internet the internet has become a circadian necessity in the human lives the more the people are using the internet the more it is developing as a result due to which in the recent years a number of cr crimes relating to it are increasing so such one of it are cyberbullying so good afternoon one and all um my quote for today is icafs p fpp4 and my topic is cyberbullying and safety facts so what is cyberbullying cyberbullying or cyber harassment is also known as the online bullying which falls under the wide umbrella term of cyber crime one of the widely accepted definition of cyber cyberbullying is that an aggressive intentional act or behavior that is carried out by a group or an individual using electronic forms of contact repeatedly and over time against a victim who cannot easily defend himself or herself and that's in simple cyberbullying is defined as the intentional harming or hurting others via the use of technology and social media coming to the types there are two types of bullying one is the offline bullying which is related to the term ragging for example in institutions schools or colleges it can be a senior ragging a junior the next form is online bullying which is associated with the bullying uh, on the social media platforms social media platforms can include facebook twitter whatsapp gmail etc a uh, example of that can be someone blackmailing them about uh, revealing their information about their private information etc as you can see here some of the facts that uh, voice calls on cell phones are used by almost 39% of teenagers to communicate with their friends boyfriend girlfriends etc only 1 in 10 kids notify that their parents if, if they have been a victim of cyberbullying and less than 1 in 5 cyber cyberbullying occurrences are reported to the law authorities in order to communicate with the and receive messages from others almost 29% of teenagers utilize social networking sites so coming to the methods of studying here we use an uh, cyber bullying poll by using an unstructured interviewing style to interview people who work as uh, students teachers managers etc uh, as you can see cyber bullying uh, rises in criteria of five five criteria it that is intention publicity anonymity power imbalance and repetition as you can see in the pie chart almost 50% of them have been faced cyberbullying 21% haven't faced and the rest 29% may have been faced with the cyberbullying so here are some of the tips for preventing or rather increasing the cyberbullying that parents and teens can use it so first one is the encouraging teens to tell an adult if there is such cyberbullying in the and also tell them that if they are a victim they, they are not punished and reassure them that being bullied is not their fault tell them to never open messages or unknown links from people they don't know and also educate them to safeguard their passwords and also all the private information regarding the inquisitive peers keep the keep the computer in a shared space like the family room and do not allow teens to have internet access in their own room parents may allow teens to wait until their high school to have their own <clears throat> email and mobile phones etc so i conclude by saying that cyberbullying is a kind of evil face and an unacceptable to the use of new technology uh, where uh, the society needs to accept it uh, properly even though the technology has been bought a uh, well developed among the students uh, we have to make as we have to make sure that we use it as uh, we use it as responsibly so if we are struggling 
with the cyber crime we can contact uh, the helpline number 155260 or you can log on to www.cybercrime.gov.in here are some of the references which i used for my study so finally i would like to thank my university my guides and the prastu jayanti college for providing me such an opportunity for presenting my poster thank you good afternoon all uh, my code psp2 i hereby present my poster on the topic the application of offline signature identification and verification system in forensic science so we all know that the area of signature verification is a broadly researched topic in the last few decades signatures are widely used as a means of verification and uh, like personal identification so we know many documents such as forms contracts bank checks credit card transaction requires this signature so it is like an of utmost importance to be able to recognize signature and like we need to what um, recognize signature and accurately and effortlessly we need to recognize it so signature verification system identifies compares and analyzes the signature extracted from checks and documents with genuine reference to fraud it helps us in discriminating if a given signature is genuine or false so this offline signature verification system it is it uses the imaging technique uh, to first scan the signature and it is then pre processed so then it involves the extraction of data which is obtained by cameras or scanners in digital format and later processed and analyzed in a statistical method so this is a user friendly and non invasive technique so next is the review so this a the aim of the offline signature verification involves identification of the owner of signature and whether the signature is original or forged so in this poster i have taken two features that is angular and energy density feature to differentiate the signature so what is the methodology so it includes the data acquisition first method so whether the so where the data for the verification is acquired from various ways like optical pads and scanners so the next step includes the pre processing that is before processing the image for feature extraction some pre processing algorithm like binarization denoising and thinning is applied here so what is binarization it is like conversion of a multitonal image to a bitonal image like a grayscale image we convert it into black and white so next is denoising it is a task of removing noise from an image so it restores the true image so noise removal also obtains a high quality image here the thinning thinning is done so that the thin image requires less storage compared to the original image so the third feature is that third is that the feature extraction so in feature extraction so what is that means like like it is an important part where we decide which portion of part are extracted or which is useful for the system to perform and give optimum result so there are two types of approaches being used that i said earlier so for this feature extraction that is first one is angular method second one is energy density method so what is angular method in this method the pre processed image is resized and partitioned into four portions uh, or cells using equal horizontal method so then each partition is divided into three rows and three columns of equal size making it of like a total of nine subset so like we take each subset and calculate the angle of each pixel then taking the mean value of it so like this is repeated for all the subsets by doing this we determine the angle of uh, the particular cell the next is that the energy density method so in this method the image is divided into various segment and the energy density of each segment is calculated by counting the total number of ounces ounces in sense it is like uh, the total like uh, um the total number of white pixels in a segment so the image is segmented into four equal by cut, by counting the total number of ounces of each of them so for the study i have taken let's uh, for the study in the in the review it was taken 50 genuine and 50 forged samples and the performance based on the angular and energy density method was calculated on the basis of frr and far that is false rejection ratio and false acceptance ratio and it was found out that the accuracy rate was found to be 84 percentage in far and accuracy rate was found to be 89 percentage in frr so from the evo analysis from the result from the result table both the feature extraction method gave an improved efficiency and accuracy provided better far and frr so from this we can infer that this proposed method has been a, like a successful uh, successfully made for offline signature verification efficient accurate and possible to detect the false skill forgeries and preventing human errors during the signature process and lowers the chances of fraud in the process of authentication so it used a compact and memory efficient storage of feature points which reduce the memory overhead 
thank you that's all about my question so uh, good good afternoon everyone so the topic that i would or the idea that i would like to put forward today uh, would be apple iphone ipads lidar sensing artificial intelligence and augmented reality which is supposed to be the next step of evolution in the crime scene reconstruction and documentation field so <clears throat> before going into the idea let us uh, make it a bit more simpler for the understanding so i'll start with explain what is augmented reality it is basically a layer of digital enhancement on a physical entity uh, for example to simplify we can say it as uh, you know the application of uh, a beautification filter or a ai camera that we use nowadays in most of the phones to beautify or make ourselves look a tad bit more better than what we are and artificial intelligence can be uh, uh, you know defined as the smartness or the ability of an of a uh, device to actually uh, analyze the situation and make calculated and reproducible uh, judgments according accordingly and uh, lidar sensing or lidar sensors which is a pillar of my idea is basically a radar sensor which uses light rather than using microwave uh, echoes so this particular system works similarly to a radar it's just the fact that it uses short bursts or straight burst of a laser beam is the only difference so it it makes a 3d uh, re, uh, real time 3d rendering of whatever object that is in front of it and is, for this purpose it is used in uh, both geographical mapping cartography and remote sensing applications so when i apple iphones and ipads introduced data sensors into their uh, into their devices it was actually a creative turn take, uh, taken because it was used to scan uh, multiple objects or entities and create an, a layer of creative spin on it for them or for architects to actually work out different models of a building for them but what i would like to pitch in is the usage of this particular technology and applications that are created in unison with the lidar sensors like uh, uh, planar 3d room scanner arki etc to map the crime scene uh, in a 3d rendered way this applications can be used to both make a 2d ground plan and also a 3d rendering of the crime scene this is an instantaneous and robust method to create a rendering of a crime scene considering that the two factors that affect the quality of an evidence that is collected from the crime scene is the time that is taken for the crime scene to get processed and the number of individuals that enter to a crime scene in, uh, that you know introduce more contaminants or degradation to the evidences this can cut down many steps or at least make it faster to process the crime scene in a broader perspective and if i would talk about the application of this particular system first it would be in the educational sector as onset of pandemic created the implementation of virtual labs we can use this particular technology to actually make a 3d rendered documented version of a crime scene and uh, give the real dynamics of a crime scene to the students who are attending the virtual labs and the second one is or the important one would be the use in reconstruction multiple uh, ways in which a crime could have occurred could be reconstructed and could be done in a million of ways so that we can pinpoint one single one and this that uh, when produced in the code which is third application it can be utilized by an investigator to explain their uh, theory or explain their statement without any technical jargon and an easier format for the jury and the counsel to understand and the advantages parts of this particular technique rather than to the usual ones that are used right now is the first fact that it is very instantaneous technique it hardly takes 5 to 10 minutes for a render to be made using these devices and the robustness because all the apple products are sold on the on the key of their privacy and other factors it's a robust technique and also the fact that a, a professional need not to be trained in any other way there is and as there is no need for any other sophisticated equipments in the particular feel it's a handheld device and it is easier for the person to understand and use this and it will also decrease the technique uh, the human intervention the problem that has caused by uh, errors that are caused by human interventions to a limit and considering the researchers have shown that it is a 98% it produces nine uh, render which is 98% accurate to the real one it can be easily utilized in any situation so as a concluding note i would say that as the world is going into a technical frenzy or in the technical bandwagon we should also the crime scene investigation field also should go there to remain uh, relevant and not to be obsolete and to be stuck in a time frame so with that i am uh, concluding my words and i would like questions from the judges or anyone who is willing to thank you
So yeah, my today's topic is identification of drowning death cases in forensic investigation using diatoms analysis. Uh, my code is ICAFS BSP3. So basically, uh, diatoms are unicellular eukaryotic organisms which are found in aquatic ecosystems. Uh, and diatoms are plentiful and diverse in nature. So uh, di diatoms can be helpful in uh, drown uh, death cases analysis. Uh, basically, drowning is a type of uh, effectual death, death in which respiration is uh, res uh, reserved by uh, submersion of a fluid. And it is not compulsory whether the uh, fluid is aspirated into the lungs or not. So, uh, diagnosis of the bo body can be easily done using diatoms. Uh, uh, when, uh, uh, there, there are some drowning uh, signs which we can use for the identification of body. Uh, but when a body is freshly dumped into the water body, so there are some uh, drowning uh, signs which uh, which can be presence of a uh, fine froth at the mouth and nostrils uh, impression of ribs uh, on the lungs uh, and there is some uh, swelling around the lungs but uh, when the body start decomposes and uh, skeleton uh, skeletonized there will be no such symptoms so in that case we can use diatoms for the identification uh, diatoms uh, cannot tell us about the uh, time since death but diatoms can be very uh, helpful in identification of the uh, place of death, uh, whether the because of the morphology of diatoms, uh, whether the, uh, the body found is in uh, uh, salty water, marine water, or fresh water, or uh, uh, we can identify uh, by using the following test. Uh, we can uh, do a uh, uh, microscopic test. Electron microscope is better than a uh, light microscope. We can identify the morphology using the electroscopes, uh, uh, transmission electroscope, uh, transmission electron microscope. In this microscopy, we, uh, we are able to find uh, see the finer and delicate uh, details of the uh, diatom frustules. Frustules are basically the cell wall structures of uh, diatoms, uh, which can be identifiable. And uh, in our scanning electron microscope, it is best for visualizing the entire diatom frustule, which uh, help, which is helpful in viewing the, viewing the gross morphology of the diatom. Uh, we can also use acid digestion methods, uh, in, uh, which is uh, shown in the figure, in which we can use the bone marrow of uh, femur bone or sternum because uh, they are the best uh, for uh, uh, identification of uh, diatoms. So first we take uh, the bone marrow uh, then we uh, use uh, nitric acid, uh, 5 gram of bone marrow is uh, taken and uh, in a beaker and uh, concentrated nitric acid is used. Uh, the sample is uh, left over for two days and uh, centrifugation uh, is done uh, for, for 30 minutes at uh, 2000 to 3000 RPM. Now the supernant uh, liquid is taken out from the flask and leaving behind this uh, solid residue. Then we add, add 20 ml of water and centrifuge again and again. Uh, and then we uh, repeat this step for five, six times. And uh, the and then we uh, uh, check and then we analyze the, uh, the, uh, the, the sample in microscope. So we can identify the uh, featured diatoms uh, in the test. Now uh, this uh, is uh, this. Uh, uh, Method is also useful for the analysis of the uh, anti, uh, for the case uh, in which anti mortem drowning or post mortem drowning. That is whether the body is dumped uh, before the death or of the organism or after death. In such case, uh, when uh, in anti mortem drowning, uh, there uh, water enters inside the lungs and rupture the alveolar walls, and then uh, due to the leaving condition of the body. Uh, it uh, goes into the circulatory system and go, uh, reach to the other body organs like uh, heart, kidney, brain, and all. And then um, in bone marrow also. So we can identify the diatoms uh, in bone marrow uh, and in post-mortem drowning where, where, in which the dead body, uh, already dead person is dumped into the water body. So uh, there, is, there will be no um, um, circulation in the body. Uh, the fluid will not uh, move and there will be no uh, diatoms in heart and other organ organs and not in uh, uh, bone marrow. So we can identify this kind of, uh, uh, we can identify the uh, board, uh, time of death and, uh, sorry, we can identify the place of death and whether the uh, type of death, uh, whether uh, it was uh, dumped uh, uh, inside the body, or uh, it is a murder case or whether it is a suicide or homicide case. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I would like to conclude it. And 
these are the references i would uh, take from the 